My name is Scott Nye, and this is Talking Radical Radio. Hello and welcome to Talking Radical Radio, where we bring you grassroots voices from across Canada. We give you the chance to hear many different people who are facing many different struggles talk about what they're doing, how they're doing it, and why they're doing it, in the belief that such listening is a crucial step in strengthening all of our efforts to change the world. On this week's show, I'll be speaking with Susie Goulding. In the early months of the COVID-19 pandemic, nobody knew very much about the disease. The initial picture that emerged focused on respiratory symptoms and on generic signs of viral infection, like fever. And we were told that people who didn't get sick enough to end up in hospital would get better within a couple of weeks. Right from the start, though, there were people who experienced COVID in ways that looked nothing like that. People like Susie Goulding. Goulding is 53 years old and lives in Oakville, Ontario. And before she got ill, she lived quite an active lifestyle and worked as a floral designer. When she got sick in March 2020, she didn't have a fever, she didn't have the same kinds of respiratory issues that many people have with COVID, and she was never hospitalized. But she lost her sense of taste and at various points along the way had gastrointestinal, cardiac, and neurological symptoms. Turns out, so have lots of other people. As our experience with the disease has increased, it's become clear that it affects multiple systems in the body. It can cause rashes on the skin, damage to the heart, eye pain and pink eye, delirium and hallucinations, vomiting and diarrhea, brain fog, blood clots, and lots of other things. Moreover, some of Goulding's symptoms have persisted right up until today. Some people are calling this long COVID, and those who are living with it are sometimes referred to as long haulers. The prevalence of long COVID is not currently known, but studies suggest that at least a third of people, even with mild cases of COVID, have had one or more symptoms that lasted at least six months. By June 2020, Goulding decided to take things into her own hands. She founded the COVID Long Hauler Support Group Canada, facilitated through a website and a Facebook group. The initial idea was for it to be a way to bring people together to talk about symptoms and experiences. It was meant as a place for people to seek support and share information, and also as a way to develop a sort of collective grassroots sense of the bounds of what COVID can be. Pretty soon, though, the group's activities expanded. They did a lot of media work, not only as a way to reach out and let other people with long COVID know about the group, but also to assertively publicize the seriousness of the disease in the face of those who attempt to minimize it. The group also began to do advocacy through all of the standard means, meetings with politicians, petitions, online campaigns, and so on, and they're making three broad demands. First of all, they want formal recognition that long COVID exists and a clear definition for it. This is important because without that recognition, it's often much, much harder for people to access benefits and supports. As well, it means that most official COVID statistics paint a distorted picture of the pandemic, because they usually count people with long COVID as people who have recovered. Second, they want greater investment in research specifically related to the experiences and needs of people living with long COVID. There is some, but not enough, and Goulding says Canada is lagging behind other countries. And finally, they want funding for the kind of integrated, multidisciplinary rehab that so many people with long COVID need. Other countries like the UK have started funding that sort of thing in a systematic way, but in Canada, the only options are a few very small projects within the public healthcare system or fee-for-service clinics that are not affordable for most people. Along with their own advocacy, the group is also part of a new effort to bring patients, healthcare providers, researchers, and politicians together as a coalition to push for greater attention and resources for long COVID. And they're increasingly becoming involved themselves in networking and collaborating with researchers. I speak with Goulding about long COVID and about the work of the COVID Long Hauler Support Group Canada. Hi, I'm Susie Goulding. I'm 53 years old from Oakville, Ontario. I fell ill to COVID on March the 21st, 2020. It was the first wave. Before having COVID, I lived a full life, an active lifestyle of floral designer, always on my feet, multitasking, living a fast pace. 
an active person with a young son of 12 years old, three dogs and a ski patroller and a cyclist. And I fell ill to COVID and my life changed shortly thereafter. Four days after my first symptom showed up, things went very strange. And to this day, I'm still trying to recover from the implications of the virus and most of the neurological issues, gastrointestinal issues, as well as heart cardiac issues. I founded the group on June the 20th. After going through the throes of the acute stage of the virus, there are many different symptoms that I went through with next to no support. At that time, COVID was thought to be a respiratory illness, and I had no respiratory issues at all, nor did I have a fever or any kind of oxygenation problems. So I was denied a test to find out if I had COVID on many occasions from the Ministry of Health because I didn't fit the criteria because there was a shortage of testing. So I wasn't able to get tested. It went through two months of these strange, bizarre symptoms that kept ebbing and flowing. And finally made it to the hospital on June the 2nd, where I spoke with a clinician and he said that I had a presumptive case with the symptoms that I'd been having. And he would say presumptively, we can assume that you've had a case of COVID. We can do a test right now, but it's well outside of the 14 days that the testing can show a positive test. So it'll probably come back negative. So it did come back negative. I spoke with my GP of 30 years and I said, well, I had the test. She said, well, what were the results? And it came back negative. And she said, well, there you go. You never had COVID. And she didn't mean anything by it. She just had no information. And at that point, I knew that I had had COVID and that I was going to be sort of on my own. So I needed to connect with other COVID survivors and figure things out on our own as far as what the symptoms were and what we could do about them. And the group just grew from there. It was a very small group at first, which has grown into a group of almost 13,000 people. It's a safe place for people to go to get support who are dealing with COVID. We also have a satellite branch of groups that are targeted to the different provincial needs. So people from the different provinces can join those, as well as a COVID survivor group, which is for people who are just going through the throes of the virus and may not become long haulers. And that's where we are today. Let's talk more about long COVID and what it can look like. I'm certainly not asking you to talk about any aspects of it that you don't want to talk about, but maybe start by getting into your journey with it in a little more detail. Fell ill on March 21st. I woke up with just a tickle in my throat. Wasn't too concerning, nothing that a cup of tea with honey wouldn't cure, I thought. And then four days later, I woke up with the most bizarre onset of symptoms that would last for, you know, I'm still dealing with the symptoms now. I had pressure at the back of the base of my skull. It felt like the brain stem was really inflamed and throbbing. Out of nowhere came a really strong sinus infection. It came on very suddenly and I had problems swallowing. That was the most bizarre symptom. On one side of my throat, it felt like it was paralyzed and I was choking on everything I ate or tried to drink. And then I, I developed a really terrible cough. I lost my sense of taste. Everything tasted metallic for a few days. And then the cough turned into digestive issues. I woke up one morning with symptoms of GERD. It was a lot of gas and really terrible heartburn. And so these symptoms didn't seem to be going away. Four weeks into it, I started having cardiac issues. I never had any breathing issues. I never have any lack of oxygen issues. But it did end up in my heart. I thought at one point I was going to expire in the night. I thought I was having a heart attack. I was having terrible pain, chest pain on the left side, sort of like a muscle spasm in my heart. And my heart was doing erratic heartbeats, skipping beats, going into tachycardia. And it was just very scary. From there, the symptoms didn't get better. And I started to get dizzy and off balance. I started having issues with my vision, with memory. And these symptoms just were really scary. They were very unusual. They were bizarre. And nobody seemed to know anything of any of the medical community that I spoke with. Even the specialists had no idea what was going on and really had no advice to give at that point either. Again, people were still thinking that it was a respiratory issue. So a lot of the people in the first wave were just, you know, dismissed with all the issues that were going on because nobody knew and we didn't have any information. You know, the hundreds of symptoms that COVID can cause and being a multi-system virus, it just wasn't known at that point. I was lucky that I had my GP for 30 years and that she supported me. She never denied that I had COVID. She didn't think at that point that I did, but she never dismissed any of the symptoms that I was having. She just really didn't know. But some people were getting told that there's no way that they had COVID and that this was all in their heads and that they were making these things up and this couldn't possibly be happening to them. 
So we started to realize that there was certain breakdown between the medical community and people suffering from the virus. And there was a breakdown of our healthcare system. And then in the summertime, after sort of the acute phase, which I would say the sinus infection that I had is the only thing that went away, really. And so the rest of the symptoms I'm still left dealing with today. Now, they have gotten better over the months, some of them. When it first started happening, the brain fog was completely debilitating, as well as a huge wall of fatigue, which really left me bedridden for weeks. I couldn't do much. And if I did, I would start having tachycardia issues. I was just really terrified at what was happening with my brain and the issues I was having with my memory and my executive cognitive function or dysfunction. I really was losing my memory and felt like I was living with Alzheimer's. I was having trouble reading books. I couldn't remember what was on the previous page and I just couldn't follow the story. Had very poor concentration. And when it started to happen in June, it felt like a concussion. It was very debilitating, really flipped my life upside down because I wasn't able to do really much of anything. And again, as I told you, I had previously lived a very active lifestyle and going forward was just a struggle in trying to find specialists and being tossed around from specialist to specialist, you know, waiting months to speak to a specialist. And beyond your experiences with long COVID, what kinds of things have you heard from the broad range of people you've talked to through the group about other ways that people have been experiencing it? Long COVID seems to present differently in everyone. And for every person that has it, their symptoms will all manifest differently. It is a multi-system virus, so it can hit you at any system of your body. There's issues with the brain, issues with the lungs, breathing, issues in the heart and the kidneys and with the skin, many of the major organs. It can show up anywhere. So a lot of people, the main symptoms would be the brain fog, heart issues, cardiac issues, and lung issues. So a lot of people have dyspnea, problems breathing. People are being diagnosed with postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which is a dysautonomic dysregulation. And people are having problems with their pulse and not being able to regulate. They're also having skin issues, a lot of rashes, COVID toes. People are losing hair. Hair loss is a big symptom. Chronic fatigue syndrome, a lot of people are presenting, like the fatigue that I was saying, they're being diagnosed with ME-CFS as well as mast cell activation, which is another diagnosis that people are getting. I'm just trying to remember everything. But yeah, there's well over 200 different symptoms. The top symptoms would be probably the brain fog, the fatigue, and cardiac and breathing issues. Tell me more about how the COVID Long Hauler Support Group Canada got started. The group started just as an idea of bringing people together to be able to speak about symptoms and just to sort of clear the air on what was going on and if this was going on with other people and what was going on with them. And as we started gathering, you know, we were reaching out to other people and the group was quickly aligning itself. And then media started reaching out to us. So it became a mission to try and warn other Canadians that COVID was not necessarily a 14-day illness that you would recover from quickly, and that there was this cohort of people who were not recovering and who would not recover in months. And just to prevent yourself from getting the virus by taking all the precautions, and then some, that the Ministry of Health were trying to tell people to, you know, mask and social distance. And really, we're just trying to reach out to do as much media as we could to warn people that this was something that the government was actually not warning people about. So we felt that it was our responsibility to do such. And that just kind of led to advocating for our rights. As we went through the first wave, a lot of us were denied testing. So when we were tested, in my case, I was tested, I had a negative result. Uh, And just to clarify for listeners, people whose symptoms didn't match the narrow criteria for testing that they had during the first wave couldn't get tested then. And if they were tested later, like Goulding, they generally tested negative, which says nothing about whether they had COVID because it was long after the virus would have been cleared from their system anyway. 
But what happened down the line months later is that when the research started happening, we weren't able to join any of the research groups because we had a negative test. Although I had a clinical diagnosis from two doctors, I wasn't able to join the research groups. And these groups, this is the only way that people were getting into any kind of rehab. So it ended up being like a platform for us to advocate as well for long haulers because there was so much need for conversation between what was needed for long haulers to be recognized and to recover. We weren't getting any help and we needed help from the government as far as setting up rehabilitation clinics and things were just a mess. So is it fair to say that the work of the group breaks down into being partly a place for people with long COVID to support each other and partly a way for people with long COVID to advocate for themselves? Yes. Part of it is advocacy and part of it is a support network for people. A lot of information has been gathered. We try to organize things for people who come to the group to be able to find things easily. And now we're networking with researchers. So it's sort of become a platform for researchers to reach out, to have access to people who have survived, for researchers to be able to apply for grants and work with us. Patient partnership with researchers and with the medical community is very important so that the researchers really understand what they're trying to research and how they can best help us. And, you know, the best way for them to find that out is through connection with patients who've had the virus. On the support side of the work, what do people with long COVID generally need when they first find the group? So I think when people first find the group, it's just a big sigh of relief that they found other people who know what they're going through. Because COVID is such a bizarre experience. So it's just this realization of, oh, I found this community of people who really understand and are not going to, you know, dismiss. We provide a safe place that's without judgment. People can really vent or they're having a bad day, just write out all their sorrows and their fears and they're greeted with open arms and nobody disputes anything that anyone says. So it's a very safe place and it's very supportive with other members that will come in and, you know, we'll all share our stories and try to support one another. People come generally to get information, but also to join with other survivors that really understand what each other are going through. And on the advocacy side of the group's work, what are your key demands? The group has been speaking with MPs and MPPs, and we've put out three petitions. Basically, what we're trying to ask the government is for recognition, research, and rehabilitation. Recognition in the fact that long COVID exists. It needs to be defined so that people are able to access, you know, long-term disability benefits and they're not being written off because there's no definition of what's happening to them. A lot of people are not able to collect benefits and so forth. So a definition of what long COVID is, is the first thing that needs to be addressed. Recognition as far as the dashboard of statistics that Health Canada says deaths and recoveries. And we want people to understand that there is a third cohort in the deaths and recoveries. There's long COVID and people should know that. And our numbers should be counted to get a clear indication of how many people are suffering going forward with this. So that's the recognition. The research, we need the federal government to fund research. We need broad cohort research done and we need deep funding. Just in the States, just to give you an example, the government has funded a loan for the research of long haulers, $1.5 billion into that research. Canada has really fallen far behind that. So we're asking for a lot more money and budget put into the research of long haulers. This is something that's going to have a huge societal impact going forward is there's quite a large percentage of long haulers that they're saying now of studies out of the UK and of Italy. Some of the studies say up to 40 to 50 percent of people will end up being long haulers. There already have been studies of the critical cases of hospitalization that also end up as being long haulers is 85 percent of those cases. So if you combine that with the number of people who are mild cases that end up with long COVID, the number is quite large. So that needs to be reflected in the budget that's set aside to study these people. And then as far as rehabilitation, Canada has fallen so far behind what's happening in other countries. It's almost embarrassing. In the UK, there are 81 clinics that have been set up solely to help long haulers with their rehabilitation. And these clinics are accessible to everyone. They just need a doctor's referral to be able to get into these clinics. And Canada really has none, you know, not many. And the ones that we do have 
the hospital that are facilitating them. It's out of their hospital budget. Provincially, we're just asking for rehab centers that are accessible for everyone and that are going to house an interdisciplinary approach to treating COVID. Approaching it from, you know, seeing one specialist and then six months later, seeing another specialist and without anyone communicating or without coordinated efforts, there's really no impact on treating the symptoms that we're having. It really needs to be an interdisciplinary approach. I'm very lucky to have a rehab that I'm doing at the moment. I started about a month ago. It's an interdisciplinary approach. And they took me on as a case study. So I am actually accessing treatment that is actually really helping alleviate some of the symptoms. People are going to need to access programs in order to get well, because we're not getting well on our own. This program that I'm in, I'm seeing six different people. And these people are all working together, giving me different exercises and trying to deal with the symptoms that I'm having. And if it wasn't for this integrated approach, you know, it does affect many different systems in your body. It's the only way that people are going to recover. So going forward, rehabilitation is going to be very important. A network of rehabilitation clinics is going to need to be put into place, really defining what does rehabilitation look like for long haulers and how are we going to get that up and running? One of the main problems is that, you know, any of the rehab that's available to people now is pay out of pocket. So, you know, a big issue that's being spotlighted is that really is our healthcare system working? And I think that it's really not, you know, our universal health care doesn't really seem to be too universal when the people who were in critical care are able to access inpatient and outpatient rehab. These people are all covered and they're covered with their benefits and so forth and such. But people who weren't hospitalized, and it's kind of strange because people who are hospitalized seem to be recovering. And in some sense, the people who have mild cases, well, we were termed as having mild cases. I wouldn't consider those symptoms that I went through mild, but we were called mild cases because we didn't need supplemental oxygen. And so the mild cases in some cases end up getting worse and not recovering. We're actually in dire need of rehabilitation. And the only way that we can access it is through benefits or pay out of pocket. A lot of people are not able to work at this point, have been laid off or whatever, unable to collect benefits because they don't qualify for CRB. And so there's no way that they can access pay out of pocket rehab. I mean, I wouldn't be able to afford it. If I wasn't offered to be taken on as a case study, I wouldn't be able to afford this. This is going to be around a $5,000 rehab program that I'm going through. So it's just a sad situation where we think that we have universal health care in Canada here, but we really have to question what's going on when it's so fragmented and doesn't work for everyone. So it's really not so universal. What approaches has the group taken in your advocacy for recognition, research, and rehabilitation? We've done a lot of media. The media has been a really important to give us a voice and provide us with that platform to be able to create the awareness amongst ourselves, amongst people who are suffering and enabling them to find the group and reach out to us. We've been reaching out to local politicians, but it's been very difficult because these politicians are really busy. We have written three petitions. We've written letters to all of the provincial healthcare professionals asking them for help. You know, we're just reaching out to as many different politicians as we can and trying to get someone who will listen to us. Slowly but surely, we have found a couple of people. Daniel Blakey in the NDP party, as well as Elizabeth May. Uh, And she's a Green Party MP. Who have taken it upon themselves to try and support our cause and help out long haulers. And you said that the group is getting more directly involved itself in working with researchers. What's happening in terms of research and what needs to be happening? People are showing interest. There are researchers across the country that have projects that are up and running. Most of the studies started up as acute care studies, studying the acute cases. And these studies sort of morphed into taking on a few long haulers. There are grants that are up for grabs now that are more targeted towards long haulers, and this is what needs to happen going forward. So we've had the first year of the virus, and that was mostly on the study of the acute cases and how to deal with hospitalizations and the critical care. And so now is the time for long haulers to have some kind of research done. 
And so we need to have much more funding. It needs to be a coordinated effort, a larger longitudinal effort. I mean, what needs to happen is we need a lot more money budgeted from the federal government. What we're trying to do now is focus on creating a coalition of professionals, as well as politicians, doctors, medical personnel, researchers, and patients that are going to come together to be able to speak with policymakers. We need to put some pressure on. There are a lot more studies that need to be done. You know, we know that most of the long haulers have neurological based implications and, you know, that 85% of the people are having this brain fog. So I think that that warrants an in-depth study of what the neurological implications are from the virus. And that hasn't happened yet. So these are important things that need to be communicated to the policymakers. What does the COVID Long Hauler Support Group Canada have planned over the coming months? The group is really immersed in networking with researchers. We have a lot of patient partner relationships starting up. So going forward, it's really important that people who do have long COVID can reach out and hopefully we can connect researchers with people in our group because we will be working closely with them in partnership. So we will be getting the latest information on how to deal with the symptoms of COVID and whatever researchers are finding out. We will have access to that information as it comes. So going forward, it's just really important for us to be able to be there for the researchers, to provide people who will do these studies, as well as you know the rehab that's only accessible through these research groups now will then become available to people in the group just you know through osmosis. They will let us know what things are working and what we can do to help other people. We got a bigger part of what's going on as far as this coalition that we're hoping will also create a line of communication between the federal government and, you know, sewing everything together to make the community heard federally. So this coalition will hopefully come to light within the next month or so and will certainly help out our cause as far as organizing, you know, from the top down federally to provincially what long haulers actually really need to happen. We need the government support. You have been listening to my interview with Susie Goulding of the COVID Long Hauler Support Group Canada. To find out more about the group, go to covidlonghaulcanada.com. To find out more about Talking Radical Radio, the guests, the theme music, and the ways that you can listen, go to talkingradical.ca and click on the link for the radio show. On the site, you can sign up for email updates or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, iTunes, SoundCloud, and other platforms. I'm Scott Nye, a writer and media producer based in Hamilton, Ontario, and the author of two books of Canadian history told through the stories of activists, published by Fernwood Publishing. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you tune in again next week. 